The Honda Civic Type R has gone through quite a few generations, ranging from the EK9 all the way through to the current one, the FL5. There's one generation though that's often considered to be the weakest link, the FN2. Just how bad is it and does it deserve the hate? Well, I'm going to give it the Car Obsession Throwback Review treatment to find out. Even before the FN2 rolled off the Swindon production line, it was already at a disadvantage. For starters, it had to follow up the simply iconic EP3, with its rev-happy 2.0-litre naturally aspirated VTEC engine, keen handling and that distinct bread band shape, the EP3 proved to be a very popular hot hatch. Even to this day it is popular. I should know, I owned one. The FN2 is quite the departure from the EP3 low. Long gone is that bread band shape. In its place you have a more rounded, futuristic design. I think even to this day it looks pretty cutting edge. Now under the bonnet you have virtually the same engine, although Honda has spoiled us with loads of extra power because you get one extra horsepower in this car yes one thanks honda you shouldn't have the engine code if you want to be really geeky and nerdy has changed so the ep3 was k20a2 whereas the fn2 is k20z4 or z4 if you're watching this in the us of a now, as well as giving us loads of extra power the VTEC was tweaked to come in sooner at 5,200 RPM and the red line in this car is around 8,000. The exhaust was also tuned to give a deeper sound. So at this point, you're probably thinking, well, things are moving in the right direction. Why are people hating on this car? Well, <clears throat> let me take you to the rear. For the EV3, Honda used a multi-link setup here. Whereas for the FN2, to save money, they fitted instead a torsion beam and that is going to have an effect on the ride and also the driving dynamics of the car. Speaking of the driving dynamics, this car is heavier inevitably. Every new car that comes along always seems to be heavier, that's just a fact of life in most cases. So roughly speaking this is around 60 kilograms heavier compared to the EP3 so it has that ruined a very good recipe. Let's go for a spin and find out. VTEC, oh. and that's pretty much 60 miles per hour. As mentioned, under the bonnet, this has a two litre naturally aspirated VTEC petrol engine, which offers 201 horsepower along with 193 newton meters of torque. If you prefer the 10 pound feet, I will of course drop a caption below. If you work the slick changing six speed manual gearbox quickly enough, you will hit 62 miles per hour in 6.6 .6 seconds, which even by today's standards is pretty respectable. The top speed, if you can hit it legally, is 146 miles per hour. So, my first impressions driving this car. It's worth noting that before I was given this car by Honda UK, I had never ever driven an FN2. I hadn't even sat in one. So I was intrigued to see if this car deserves all of the criticism that it receives. One of the first things that hit me about this car, just rolling it a few meters, was the ride. I'm sure many of you will know about the firm ride of the FN2, it's been well documented. So I don't want to bang on about it too much, although it's kind of, although it's kind of hard not to. What's quite cool is you have a little display on the digital speedo on the right hand side and it tells you when you're in the VTEC zone. Not that you really need it because you can hear when you're in the VTEC, you can hear the change in engine note. But yes, anyway, back onto the ride. This, as I've mentioned, has got a torsion rear beam and as a result, it is firm. I would say it's bordering on hard. I've driven many performance cars over the years. I've been very lucky to do so, and I own two performance cars. Yes, an MX-5 is a performance car. Mine's turbocharged, so nah. 
and both of those cars are on modified suspension. One's on coilovers, one is on lowering springs, and both of those ride more nicely than the FN2 does. And you have to remember, of course, this is on stock suspension. So if you're looking for a modern classic hot hatch that offers a compliant ride, you won't want to go for this because, yeah, it's um, a little bit of a bone shaker, if I'm going to be honest. That is well documented, but I wanted just to add to that with my own thoughts, of course. Yeah, and whilst this is firm, to give the car its credit, it is pretty flat in the corners. The front end and the chassis as a whole isn't quite as darty or as responsive as what I can remember from my EP3, but it's not bad. It's not bad by any means. Now let's speak about more complementative areas of the FN2. As I've mentioned, the gear change is very pleasing. It's mechanical, slick, and it just slides into place really nicely. The gear lever isn't mounted as high as the EP3, which I would prefer. Yes, it made the dash look a little bit ungainly, but from a driving point of view, it worked. The gear lever position in this, I've got no problem with it. It's just not quite as race car feeling as the EP3. The pedals have got a good weight to them. The brake pedal's got a nice firmness to it. And the brakes themselves have got a good bite. No complaints there. The steering is well weighted. It's got a, a nice firmness to it, much like the brake pedal. So there are positive areas of this car. But the ride, yes, that is, I am going to say it, it is for me a detractor. It feels almost too firm, if you ask me. Yes, I know this is a hot hatch. You have to have a firmer ride by nature, but this just feels a little bit overcooked. Unless you're on a nice smooth road, you will be jiggled about a bit. On the plus side, these seats are fantastic. I think pretty much every Type R I've driven has had fantastic sports seats in them. What I will say for the FN2, and I'm pretty sure I had the same complaint with the EP3, is that they are set quite high. I have set this seat to its lowest, but even so, it does feel like I'm sat on the car as opposed to in it, and I feel quite high up. I also found that I've not really been able to get a driving position that I favour. I mucked about for quite some time this morning and no matter what I did, what I tweaked, I couldn't quite get a uh, position which I liked. One thing I will say is that the steering wheel hasn't got a great deal of adjustment. Yes, you do get rake and reach adjustment, but it's not as adjustable as I would have liked. I'm going to say something which will offend many FN2 owners, I'm sure, but this is my own personal opinion. This doesn't feel particularly fast, if I'm going to be honest. And there will be some of you that will say, well, Aaron, you're, you've been desensitised because you've been lucky enough to drive more modern performance cars. And I get that. But from what I can remember from my EP3, my EP3 just had a bit more fizz about it. Granted, it had a bit more horsepower, but not a great deal, and it was a bit lighter. But even so, this, the engine, it makes the right noises, and the throttle response is pleasing, but it just feels, dare I say, a bit blunt, a bit numb. This car can be fun when you drive it hard in the right conditions, but it hasn't got the same X factor that EP3 has. I tried to get into this car with as open mind as possible. I know what's been said about this car, but I wanted to ignore that. I wanted to judge the car for my own. For my, I wanted to judge the car for myself. I tried not to have any preconceptions. Even so, 
I'm sorry, Honda UK. I'm underwhelmed. I'm also hot as well. This car, as standard, did come with dual zone climate control, but um, yeah, the one, the system in this car needs a regas. So if I'm looking very clammy, it's because I have no air con. It's very warm in here. Hot hatch, hot cabin. Oof. Speaking of the dual zone climate control, this came as standard on the GT trim level, which was £1,000 more compared to the standard Type R. The GT also offered cruise control, front fog lights, automatic lights and wipers, as well as curtain airbags. HID headlights were also included on GT versions 2008 onwards. For those wanting even more, there was the Championship White Edition, which gave the FN2 that iconic Honda Championship White paintwork, as well as a limited slip differential for good measure. There was also the Mugen 200, which was similar to the Championship White Edition, only with styling upgrades from Mugen and only 200 were made. That wasn't the only Mugen FN2 though. There was the much rarer Type R Mugen, of which just 20 were made. This featured a 2.2 litre VTEC which had upgraded pistons, cams and ECU, meaning it could offer 40 more horsepower. Part of the appeal of a hot hatch is practicality. Like its predecessor, the FN2 Civic Type R was only available in three door guys, but if you're willing to spend more money, you can buy the FD2. This wasn't sold in the UK, however, a few have been imported in and this gives you rear doors and it's also regarded as one of the best Civic Type R's ever made. Back to the FN2, rear space will be tight for taller occupants, I'm 6 foot 2, but the boot makes up for it with an impressive capacity of 485 litres, one of the largest in its class. Despite some of my negative thoughts on this car, there may be some of you watching this still thinking, well Aaron, I don't care about what you've said, I still want to own one. So you may be wondering how much you should be looking at to buy one. Well, if you're happy with a higher mileage example, you can get one for under £4,000 if you look hard enough. If you want a more pristine example, of course you'll need to pay more money. What should you look out for? Well, these are driven by a timing chain as opposed to a timing belt. The idea of a timing chain is that in theory, in theory, it should last the lifetime of the car. That's not to say they can't uh, fail prematurely, and it's really important that these cars are serviced when they're meant to be. These engines, they do burn through more oil than other engines, so it's important to check your oil often and also make sure it's serviced when it's due. Don't put it off because you could give yourself larger problems down the line. Other things worth bearing in mind, the paint on these is quite soft. So if you see an example that's got quite a bit of stone chipping, don't be surprised. Conversely, if you see a car that's had a fresh paint job on the front, don't assume it's been in an accident. It's probably where the owner has wanted to freshen up the front of the car. So don't let that put you off. Of course, do your HPI checks and so forth. But yes, if it has had fresh paint on the front, that isn't a reason to walk away. Well, not necessarily. The modules for the folding electric door mirrors can fail. In fact, this happened on this very car. So if I go to fold the door mirrors in, yeah, they move a few millimeters and go, nah, you're all right, mate. Other issues to look out for on the FN2 is the PCV valve blocking up, which can cause a crackling sound at idle. If the noise goes by squeezing this vacuum hose, it's likely the PCV valve is the culprit. The gearbox can whine when you reach a biting point on the clutch, but that is a quirk on the FN2 and is nothing to worry about. However, that's not to say that the transmission isn't without any issues. Some examples can experience crunching in second gear and early cars can have difficulty with third gear thanks to a worn synchro. Moving to the rear of the car, the rear spoiler may give the car a sporty look but because of its location it does spoil the rear visibility. The lights under the spoiler can suffer from water ingress so look out for evidence of that. Also, pre-2008 cars allowed water through the tops of the doors which led to rust forming. On the topic of rust, boot floors can rust as can the roof as the rubber at the top of the windscreen can cut into the paint. I think a conservative way to put it is that the FN2 Civic Type R isn't a bad car, but arguably a bad Type R. However, 
I do respect Honda for sticking to their guns though, because when this car was made, even back then, a lot of car manufacturers were moving over to turbocharging, and there weren't that many cars that were still naturally aspirated, but Honda said, no, we want this to remain NA, and I do salute to them for that, but it kind of makes you think, maybe this one should have been turbocharged. I don't know, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Of course, the FK2, which replaced this car, that was turbocharged. But a part of me thinks, what would have been if this had been introduced to forced induction? Of course, there are people that have fitted turbos and superchargers retrospectively to these cars. And that must, that must really transform it. But in its standard form, yeah, it's quick-ish, but I am left wanting more. So then, to conclude, does the FN2 Civic Type R really deserve all of the hate? Well, to be honest, I can see where it stems from. Compared to the EP3, this is firmer, heavier, and realistically offers the same amount of power. So when you put it as, as black and white as that, it's clear to see why this is deemed to be the worst Civic Type R but this isn't a bad car. It still has its plus points. It still has that wonderful rev happy engine. It still has the fantastic gearbox and it's still pretty good in the corners. I think if you're looking to buy this car and keep it standard, perhaps you may be disappointed, but I would say this serves as a good base for modifications. If you want to add more power, tweak the suspension, I think you've got a properly sorted hot hatch on your hands and who knows? This could be the best Civic Type R with a few choice modifications. Anyway, time for me to end. I do hope you have enjoyed this video. A big thank you to Honda UK for loaning me this car for the weekend. And of course, a big thank you to you guys watching this video. If you have found it enjoyable or useful, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you are subscribed, don't forget to click the bell icon so you get notified every time I make a video. But until the next time, guys, be sure to keep up the car obsession.